Good morning, LRC. You here? Let's stand to our feet. And um, we're going to open up service just a little bit different. Well, actually, sit back down. Sit back down. Um, we're going to open up service a little bit different this morning. Um, we have some Kids Life kids that would like to do a little presentation of some things that they have learned in their Sunday school class um, today. And they want to present it to y'all. So if we'll give, give them our attention, if they want to come and stand. children know in the word of God. Amen. My daughter's only two, but the fact that she got up there and maybe said something, I don't know. <laughs> Let's go ahead and stand and get ready to worship this morning. Thank you all for being here today. Let's just surrender our all to him today because he is worthy. He deserves all the praise and glory and honor. Amen. Worship with us this morning.
up your hallelujah right now. Give him the highest praise today for he's worthy. Hallelujah, Lord. We honor your name, Jesus. We give you all the glory in this place today, God. You and you alone deserve the praise, Jesus. Abraham, you're the God of covenant and grateful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain safe.
we can trust to put our faith and our hope in him for he will never let us down he'll never leave us he'll never forsake us hallelujah come on put your faith in him today you can put your faith in him right now no matter what you're facing no matter what you're going through your hands to the Lord for he is our faithful God hallelujah Jesus. hallelujah hallelujah he's a faithful God. God come on can you worship a faithful God come on can you give praise to the one who has never left you who has never forsaken you but he's with you always even unto the ends of the earth Come on, he's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. The, the Bible says he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Oh, we worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. I'm thankful that he is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. And without his faithfulness, I don't know where I would be today. Because he's been more faithful to me than I've been faithful to him. Because there's been many times in my life that I've turned my back and I've walked away from him. But every single time I understand and realize he's always there waiting for me to return. <laughs> I said he's faithful, somebody. He, listen, I... He knew when he created us that we would be imperfect uh, and that we would mess up from time to time and that we would make mistakes from time to time. And yet he still loved us uh, and he's still faithful to us. Uh, oh, my God. Y'all don't get me started today. Hallelujah. Man, I'm just so thankful for the presence of the Lord that I feel in this house today. thankful to every one of you that are here today. If you are a guest here, thank you for joining us here at Life Restoration Center. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us in a time of worship unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we welcome you here today and uh, we invite you, if you don't have a, a home church, we invite you to be a part of this family. And we will welcome you with open arms and we will love on you like Jesus loves on you. Amen. And with that being said, if you are new here, and or maybe if you've been coming for a little while and we, we don't have your information, we would welcome you and invite you to scan the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you, and that will take you to a link so that we can get your information. We're not going to send you any spam. We're not going to send you a bunch of junk. Uh, we just want to get your information um, so that we know who you are, and, uh, and so we're just thankful that you're here today. And then also, if you have not downloaded the Church Center app, we would welcome you and invite you to do so. If you don't know how to do so, see myself, see Avery, 
um, Patrick Talisha afterwards uh, after service, and we'll get you fixed right up. Um, because our church center app is how we do a lot of our communicating in the church as well as social media. Um, and so you don't want to miss out anything uh, on anything that's going on here in the church. And so we would invite you to do so and, and join that. Now, that's all the announcements I'm giving you. Remember what I told you last week? And I think some of y'all took it to heart because I saw some of y'all stopping by the TV before service and, and scanning and making sure you got everything. So with that being said, if you don't have you don't know what's going on, stop at the TV in the foyer. Stand there for about five minutes and watch the scroll, and you'll see everything that's going on here in the church. And uh, so we invite you. But today is Baptism Sunday. Woo! So I think we've, uh, I think we've got, uh, I think five signed up right now to be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus Christ. That's exciting, exciting things happening. Listen. And just because you didn't sign up, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you can do so today. You don't have to sign up. We'll make it happen right now. Amen. Somebody says, well, I've already been baptized. Well, listen, if you were baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that there's nowhere in Scripture that anyone was ever baptized in those titles. Because, well, you say, well, Matt, what about Matthew 28, 19? Yes, it does say, go ye baptizing them in the name. And there's only one name, and that name is Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are just titles. Can I get an amen from somebody? So if you've ever been, if you were baptized, but it was in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I would encourage you to do it the right way today and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins because He is the only, that is the only saving name. It was Jesus that went to the cross. Listen, you say, well, I don't understand what you're saying. See me after service, and I'll break it down a little more for you. I don't have time to do it today, right now. But see me after service, and I'll break it down for you a little more. Mm. Mm. Somebody said break it down. <laughs> Somebody said break it down. <laughs> I'll go ahead and break it down real quick. See, I am one person, but I have three distinct titles. I am a father to my son. I am a son to my father. And I am a pastor to this church. But I am still one person and I have one name. My name is Donnie Freeze. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> because the moment I was buried with him in baptism, I took on the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I feel my help coming on. There's only one name, the Bible says, whereby we must be saved, and it is the name of Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus Christ. Now listen, y'all done got me breaking out in a sweat. Woo! If we ain't careful, somebody's liable to get free today. I don't know about y'all, but I feel freedom in the house today. I believe God has come to set somebody free. I believe that God has come to loose somebody from the chains and the shackles and the captivity that has had you bound. My God says I have come to set the captives free. So whatever's got you bound today, I've come to release you in the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if it's fear. It doesn't matter if anxiety. It doesn't matter if it's alcohol. Come on, somebody. God said, he who the Son has set free is free indeed. And he has come to release you and loose you in the power of the Spirit. Somebody says, why, why you act that way? I'll tell you why I act that way. Because I remember who I used to be. And I'm, but thank God I'm not who I used to be. I may not be who I need to be yet. But my God is still working on the inside. Me and my brother used to sing a song when we were kids. We hated singing. When my grandfather pastored the church, they'd make us get up and sing, and we hated it. 
or I hated it. My brother may not have. He likes the attention. Hopefully he's watching later on. But we used to get up and sing a song. I don't even remember what I was going to say now. Yeah, he's still working. That's it. That's it. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Y'all know what I'm saying. We used to sing. I didn't want to sing that song. But the, the, the mode of the message is true. It doesn't matter how long you've been serving God or how long you've been living. You may have been saved for 50 years. It don't matter. He's still working on you. Because of the fact of the matter is, none of us are saved yet. None of us are walking the streets of gold. But he's still trying to work on us to make sure that we're all we need to be while we're walking on this earth so we can declare the goodness of Jesus Christ. I've got to quit. I've got to quit. That ain't even in my notes, y'all, and I ain't even started preaching yet. And I, Lord, help me. I got more notes than I got time today. And we got baptism Sunday, and we got first, step, first steps. Step four today. Everybody going through step four graduates today from first steps. You say, well, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, when you graduate first steps, go through step four, then we get you plugged into a dream team so that you can start serving and being a part of this church and, and, and implementing some things uh, in, in this church and helping us reach those that come into this church and love on those that come into this church. Amen? All right. You got your Bibles. Go to Mark chapter 10. It's 1131. I'm not, I, I'm not even going to promise you what time I'm going to be done. Mark chapter 10, begin reading at verse number 17. If you got it, say amen. You ought to have it, it's on the screen. If you didn't say oh man, then there's something wrong. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse number 17, and the Bible says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, this is the, the rich young ruler, the, and he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 25 says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, <laughs> but not with God. For all things, somebody shout all things, all things are possible with God. I want to preach to you for a little while today. I didn't even say a few minutes. I said a little while. Listen, ain't none of y'all going to be more tired than me by the time I get done. Y'all fixing to get ready to sit down. I got to stand up for the next hour and a half. <laughs> Somebody said an hour and a half. Oh, God. <laughs> I want to preach. I'm not going to preach an hour and a half, I promise. Maybe an hour and 20 minutes. I want to preach to you from this subject simply threading camels. Threading camels. Will you lift your hands and lift your voice and invite the Lord to begin to speak into our hearts right now? God, we come into your house right now. Come on, lift your voice and help me pray. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in this place. God, we invite your presence, O oh Lord, to begin to move, begin to speak, and begin to have your way. I pray, O oh God, that the very anointing of God would begin to rest upon this sanctuary. 
God, and as your word is spoken, as it is delivered, I pray right now, mighty God, that it would begin to uh, move in the life of every believer. I pray, God, that it would begin to speak to their lives, God. Begin to open up understanding and begin to give them knowledge, oh God, of what you're trying to speak into their life. God, we know that we are nothing without you, and so right now we need you. We're desperate for you, and we pray, oh God, that you would have your way in this service continued right now. In the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. As you're seated, high-five your neighbor and ask him if they've ever tried threading a camel. Now, I know that may seem a little silly, but you understand where I'm going here momentarily. Threading camels. By show of hands, how many in this house has ever tried or have accomplished threading a needle? Now, how many of those that have threaded a needle would say that it is somewhat difficult? <laughs> yeah, I see Lisa back there. You, you got to get the thread in your mouth and wet it a little bit. Then you got to get it right this close to your eye to make sure you're getting it right through the hole. So how much difficult is it going to be, the Bible says, to thread a camel? I want to talk to you today about pride. We are continuing, and today we will conclude our series on freedom fighters. God has called us all to be freedom fighters because those that enter into this church are going to be struggling. They're going to be bound. They're going to be addicted. They're going to be held captive by things in their life, and they're going to be needing people to help show them the way for Jesus to set them free. And so God has appointed and anointed all of us here today to be freedom fighters. And so I've, over the last three weeks, discussed things maybe that would happen within the church or the confines of these four walls that would hinder us and keep us from growth and keep us from being free. And so today, I want to focus on pride because pride grows because we crave independence and self-sufficiency, yet we are called depend on, to depend on God in humility. We've got to be real with ourselves and real with God. We've got to learn to set down the baggage of pride through hard conversations oh, and honest prayers. But we don't like to do those things. Because the problem is, is that pride is one of those things that restricts God from using every one of us. The next time you feel like God can't use you, I want you to remember that God used all sort of people throughout the Bible and throughout Scripture that were messed up. Noah was a drunkard, the Bible says. Jacob was a liar. Oh, I know. I don't need, uh, I need somebody to help me right now. It doesn't matter what you've done and how bad you've messed up. I, I've come to declare that God can steal and will use you if you will allow him to. So what I've come to tell you today is that there are no more excuses. God can use you to your full potential if you will allow him to. Besides, we aren't the message, we're just the messenger. The message is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And although these people definitely had their faults, the Lord still used them because in spite of their feelings, they were still willing to be obedient. In our text today, we find another man that had some faults. However, not like these other people, this man was not willing to submit to the Lord. And because of his unwillingness to be obedient, we find a tragic ending. We don't want to make the same mistakes of this rich young ruler. This is a very sad story of a man that was not willing to obey God. This rich young ruler can be a lesson for all of us. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these things down that I'm fixing to give you. Because we, have, we find three flaws in the character of the rich young ruler in this story. And, and these three flaws are actually the very things that kept the rich young ruler from having faith in God. So I want to give you three flaws that will kill your relationship with God and your faith in God. Amen. Oh, come on, y'all. Number one, security in earthly things. There are some faith-killing heart issues that we may have 
to deal with in our lives that have the potential to rob us of God's best for our lives. One of the most obvious stories in the Bible that go along with this point is the story of the rich young ruler. Unlike Peter, we know the story of Peter who had personality issues that needed to be worked out. This rich young ruler had some faith-killing heart issues that robbed him of his potential with God. It robbed him of a relationship with God. And so the first flaw that the rich young ruler had was his security in earthly things. Go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus makes it very clear in this scripture that we are not to have security in earthly things. Truth be known, we are not to even consider these earthly things. We don't even have to worry about them. But how many times do we find ourselves worrying? The only thing we have to be concerned about is seeking first the kingdom of God. And if we will seek Him and His will first, He will bring all those other things to us, the Bible says. And so the rich young ruler didn't get this about Jesus. He he couldn't separate himself from his things. Things and possessions are not bad. Hear me. It's all right to have a nice house. It's all right to drive nice vehicles. It's all right to have money in the bank. I'm not against any of that. But it's when we become dependent on those things more than God. Security and trust in those things is what makes them wrong. And when we fail to put our security in God, it kills our faith. It kills our relationship with God. Because I've come to tell you, God is our supplier. He says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. God is our security. Everything we need, we can find in Him. And so we need to learn to put our faith in God and not in the things that surround us. Because I want you to notice some things about this rich young ruler. He was rich. He was young. That was profound, wasn't it? But the main thing I want you to notice is that he was seeking out Jesus. Hear me now. Jesus was not seeking out after him. He was seeking out Jesus. And he asked Jesus one important question. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And I want you to picture this scene with me for a moment. The Bible says this rich young ruler was kneeling on the ground looking up at Jesus when he heard the answer. And that he, he said, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And the, the rich young ruler responds with, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Now notice, Jesus did not contradict what he said. He did not argue and say, no, 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 you're lying. Because he was telling the truth. He had he he'd, he'd crossed all of his T's. He had dotted all of his I's. And so this, this boy says to Jesus, I know all these commands and I've, I've always obeyed them. But now we know and understand that just obeying, hear me, just obeying the commands with Jesus was not his thing was all about. Because when Jesus arrives on the scene, he expects much more from people than just obeying a bunch of rules. Obeying rules isn't going to get you to heaven. And so in the next part of this passage, we find the the, the flaw or the faith killer of the rich young ruler. Jesus responds, uh, beholding him, loved him, and said to him, one thing that thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, 
and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. Jesus spotted something that he wanted to deliver the boy from. He wanted to set him free. And this rich young ruler's greatest weakness was that his main security was in his earthly things and not in God. The word says it is impossible to please him without faith. And so placing our trust in earthly riches and material things is the greatest flaw and faith killer that there is. There is nothing wrong with earthly things. There is nothing wrong with owning things. The only time it becomes wrong is when we place our faith and our trust in them and not in God. I've come to tell you today God is not against riches. I pray we have a hundred millionaires in this church. Speak it by faith. I speak it and receive it in the name of Jesus. God is not against riches. But I believe the main reason more people are not rich is because they would have too much faith in the riches other than God. Can God trust us with earthly things and know that we will not put our trust in them more than Him? Because the first mistake in the flaw the rich young ruler made that killed his faith was putting his security in earthly things. I'm moving on. Number two, lack of trust. There's a lack of trust. Jesus said one thing that thou lackest. The rich young ruler could not do it. He, he, he could sell what he had and give it to the poor because his security, he, he could not sell what he had and give it to the poor because his security was in his earthly things and his trust was in those things as well. And so the rich young ruler got up from his knees and he walked away. He forsook the call of God on his life. And the Bible says he grieved because he had great possessions. What was he grieving over? He wasn't grieving over his money because he still had it. He was grieving over his inability to trust Jesus. (laughs) Help me, Lord. And grieving over what could have been. And so this rich young ruler kept his money, but the flaw was that he gave up his faith. And the reason he had a lack of trust is because he didn't really believe in the character of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said after, he, after the rich young ruler leaves. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands and persecution and in the world to come eternal life. I feel like I'm rapping right now. Throwing down some lines, y'all. And the rich young ruler thought he had to give everything up and be poor all his life, and he couldn't handle that. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus wanted to make sure that he really had the rich young ruler's heart. And this rich young ruler obeyed all the commands. He was a good man. He was a solid man. But Jesus isn't happy with just obeying commands. He wants our heart. He tells the disciples, after that anyone that gives up anything for my sake is going to receive a hundredfold. We ought to be throwing stuff. The flaw of lack of trust in Jesus killed his faith. And it will do the same to us if we're not careful. We do not walk by sight. The Bible says we walk by faith. Sometimes we just have to trust Jesus no matter what we're facing. Sometimes we just got to keep walking even though we can't see where we're going. We might not understand everything that's happening, but, but at times we just got to trust in Jesus. And so the lack of trust in the character of Jesus and the ability will kill your faith every single time. Flaws in faith killers are security in earthly things and then lack of trust in Jesus. Number three, the love of money. Now people misquote this scripture all the time and they say money is evil. Money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Listen, we've got to have money to survive, y'all. 
God, uh, the Bible says that God gives us the power to give. Oh, well, oh. That's what the scripture says? <laughs> Somebody's like, well, I ain't seen it yet. Keep working. And so the lack of trust in the character of Jesus, there is the love of money. Some people read this story and they think that it is all about the money. Listen, it's not about the money. That day after the rich young ruler had left, Jesus took the opportunity to teach his disciples a lesson. And the disciples had trusted in Jesus and followed him in his ministry. But unlike the rich young ruler, none of the disciples had been told to sell all their earthly possessions. Now, this is, this is what I want you to understand. Sometimes what God requires of you, he may not require of everyone else. Oh, I'm, this ain't even in my notes, but I feel the spirit nudging me right now. So let me break it down a little more. So what may seem like a sin for you may not be a sin for somebody else. Mm, I feel my help coming on now. I said what may be a sin for you may not be a sin for someone else. So don't be looking at down your prideful little nose, self-righteous little self, judging everybody because they may not look like you, they may not talk like you, they may not act like you. Come on, let that be between them and Jesus. Woo. But yet the disciples were told to follow Jesus but not to sell what they had and give it to the poor. And the Bible says that the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the disciples' response here. Jesus says that it is extremely difficult for those that have put their trust in riches to get to heaven. And then verse 26 says that the disciples were beside themselves. They were astonished out of measure and saying to one another, then who in the world can be saved? Why would they say this? Anybody know? Well, first of all, they probably said this because most of them were well off. Y'all ain't hearing me yet. Because if they were poor as poor could be, they would have never asked them who could be saved. Because they would have known exactly that Jesus, oh, well, Jesus is talking to us. We're going to be saved. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. If they were poor, they would have been saying, praise the Lord, at the camel and the needle comment. But they were nervous that they were not going to make it. So they asked Jesus, well, then who can be saved? They didn't think that they could be saved because they were thinking, we all are like the camels here. I'm going somewhere. They were even misinterpreting what Jesus was saying. Jesus was trying to tell them that those that put their trust in riches or those that put their trust in material things or have love for money cannot make it into heaven. And I know that there are rich people that have made it into heaven. I'm not saying that they're not going to make it. But Jesus continued on by explaining to them that anyone that really follows me, they receive a hundredfold. You all are rich because you have followed me. You chose to be like the rich young ruler, then you would not be able to follow me. See, it's not money that will keep you out of heaven. It's the love of money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It didn't say money was the root of all evil. The, the, the three main flaws for this rich young ruler were that he placed his security in earthly things, he did not trust in Jesus, and he had a hidden love for money in his heart. These three flaws are definitely ways that will kill our faith. And we've got to totally co be committed and surrender to the heart, uh, our heart to the Lord. We, we've got to put our trust in Jesus and not in things. And, and the rich young ruler allowed his pride to interfere with his relationship with Jesus. If we are not careful, hear me church, we too will allow our pride to interfere with our relationship with Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and say it. 
There are people here today that will not get what they need from the Lord because your pride is in the way. (laughs) Y'all going to be mad at me today. There are people here today that did not worship with everything in. I got my eyes closed. I'm not looking at anybody. (laughs) There are people here today that did not worship with everything that was in you because you let your pride get in the way. Because you're afraid of what someone may think about you. You're afraid of what someone may say about you. You're afraid of how they may look down their self. Listen, if they want to look down their self-righteous nose at me and be prideful, go ahead. I don't care because my worship is not unto you. My praise is not unto you. But my praise and my worship are unto the only one who saved. Listen, uh, you didn't die on the cross to save me from my sins. But his name was Jesus. He is the one that surrendered his life to me. And that shed his precious blood so that I may have life and life more abundantly. So if I want to dance a little bit, just don't ignore, just go ahead and ignore me. I don't care what you think about me. If I want to jump up and down, if I want to make laps around the sink, listen, it don't, don't mind me. You do you, baby, I'll do me. Well, I got about three of you. Now, we're in church, y'all, so don't be telling no stories. You probably have an idea what answer Jesus will give us all. Most of us know what God is asking us to give up in order to follow him. But our pride is not allowing us to do so. You can sit back and lie to me all day long if you want. We've all got a little bit of pride in us down there, in there somewhere. Now, some people's pride comes out a little more often than others. But we've all got some of it in there. That's why it's important. That's why Paul said, I die to myself every single day. That's the importance of repenting every day. That's the importance of praying and communicating to God every single day because you want to make sure you're in right relationship with God because the moment you stop communicating with God and you stop reading and studying the Word of God and you stop praying, you stop fasting, you stop doing all, that's when your pride begins to rise up and you say, oh, I can do this on my own. But even if you think you know what's coming, hang on because you're going to be surprised. There may be some facets to the answer that you aren't familiar with. And they may explain why your life doesn't feel like you're in right relationship with God. This rich young ruler came to Jesus because he understood that there was something more to life than what he had. And Jesus tells him if you're going to look for real life, eternal life, then you've got to look in the proper source. Too often we allow our pride to get in the way and we look to the wrong sources of life. How often are we like this rich young ruler? We really want life. We we want eternal life. How many want to go to heaven? My God, if we didn't get 100% there, I'd be like, ooh, Jesus. The altars are open right now in Jesus' name. We all want eternal life, but we're not looking for it in the right places. We think a certain job, oh, here it comes. Somebody roll up your pants, it's about to get deep. We think our certain job or an accomplishment is going to get us there. We think a certain level of education is going to get us there. We think a certain relationship with somebody is going to get us there. Oh, the business world is full of people running to gurus looking for answers. But I've come to declare there's only one answer. And Jesus serves notice here that the only place you can find the key to life and real eternal life is from God himself. And the fact is many of us have allowed pride to enter our lives and we are looking to sources other than God. If you're still taking notes, get ready. Because I want to give you three ways to help you find life. Three ways to help you find life. Number one, we got to go to the proper source. We can't be floundering around all these other places looking for God and looking for God in all the wrong places. I don't even know if that's a song. 
But we all go looking for God and all I think it's a country song, maybe. We? we go looking for God and all the <laughs> looking for God in all the wrong places. Let's turn that into a Christian song. <laughs> Jesus says, in effect, you will never find what you're looking for if you keep looking in the wrong places. In essence, Jesus is inviting the rich young ruler to go. Oh, you ready? He's inviting him to give up his religion. Oh, my Lord, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. The rich young ruler says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him the answer, keep the law. And he says, well, I've kept the law. I've done all these things. And Jesus then invites the rich young ruler to go beyond his religious observance. Because to the rich young ruler, his rituals, his, his riches, his material things was his religion. Y'all hear what I'm telling you right now. This was his religion. And Jesus sees his honesty and he loves him anyways. And he says, okay, one thing you lack. Or in other words, your religion isn't enough, is it? Give up everything you have. Sell it. Give it to the poor and then follow me. Give up or go beyond your religion is what he was telling him. And he confirmed all these things I've kept, but I still don't have peace and assurance. He did not realize external conformity and inner obedience were required. He thought the remedy was finding something else to do. Y'all with me still? Jesus says, give up your religion. I thought I'd have more help there. You see, this church is not about religion. I don't care what name's on the church sign. This could be First Assembly of the Free Will Baptist. I don't care. Name it whatever you want to name it. It doesn't matter to me, but it's about relationship. Religion isn't going to get you anywhere. But the moment you dump your religion and jump into a relationship with Jesus, he'll begin to show himself to you. He'll begin to reveal himself to you. And he'll begin to show you the way that you should go. Come on. Oh, come on. Somebody look to your neighbor and tell, preach with the pastor. So Jesus says, give up on your religion. Give up thinking you can do something so that you can get to heaven. Give up thinking following the rules is enough. What more does the man need? Jesus then invites the man to gain a personal relationship. After you get rid of your stuff, now come and follow me. This is what you lack, a personal devotion. And Jesus calls the man to the self-sacrificing devotion, which is the characteristic of every true follower. Jesus says, you've got the religion part down. You've got the religion part down. Now what you're missing is me. How many times do we come into this church and we've got the religion part down? We know the exact time to lift our hands. Woo, I feel the spirit. We know the exact time when to sing, when not to sing, when to close our eyes and throw our head back. and Maybe, oh, I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. Yet we leave this place unchanged week in and week out because we got religion without a relationship. Oh, I'm trying to help us today. I said we've got religion without having a relationship with Jesus, and that's not going to get us anywhere. And so Jesus makes the same invitation to you and I today. Often we turn this personal relationship back into nothing more than a religion. You see, a, a personal relationship with Jesus becomes a religious phrase to describe a new set of rules we're following. I need to say that again. I said a personal relationship with Jesus now <laughs> becomes more uh, becomes a religious phrase to describe a new set of rules we're following. That's why I don't give uh, an invite here to the altar and invite people to come say the sinner's prayer. Number one, the sinner's prayer is nowhere to be found in the Bible. Amen, somebody. Now, I do believe that that is the first step in following Jesus. We do need to confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and that we want Him in our life. 
But there's more to it. It doesn't just stop there and we're saved and all, we're going to heaven. And now we can live any way we want to live and still make it. But the Bible says that we must repent of our sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And then the promise is that he'll fill us with his spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. So if you've never been filled with the power of his spirit, that can happen to you today. As a matter of fact, I believe it is going to happen today. I've got faith that God is going to open up the heavens and begin to pour out his spirit in this house here today. And so a personal relationship with Jesus. We like to base our life just off a personal relationship with Jesus and all it is is just another set of rules. I ask you today, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? This means that we have signed up, that we've prayed a prayer, and that we've attend, attended a certain kind of church. Woo, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven now. That ain't it. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I hate to burst your bubble. I preach what's in the Word here. Jesus says, follow me. Enter into a relationship with me where you are known by me and I'm known by you. Number two, I'm, I'm hurrying along. My Lord, I've already been preaching 35 minutes. Number two, replace religion with relationship. I've already been talking about it a little bit. Replace religion with relationship. Give up on external rule following for an inner devotion and obedience to Jesus Christ. Jesus, The Bible says that, that God looks on... The heart, not on the outside. So we can have all the rules together on the outside. We can look like the part. We can act like we're doing everything we need to be doing. My God, they, they're saved. I, I can look at them and know they're saved. No. Don't you ever say you can look at somebody and say they can be saved. You, anybody ever heard the, the, the old mantra, don't judge a book by its cover? They may have it together on the outside, but on the inside they may be full of dead man's bones. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to preach that right now. This personal relationship, this inner devotion has some, some startling results as we shall see. Jesus calls this man to remove the obstacle in his life. He had called him to a radical step of obedience, unloading all of his stuff. And he perceives that this is the one thing keeping him from a radical personal relationship with God. It was his riches, his wealth. And so he offers the man a, a, a security exchange. The man refuses to do so, and he wasn't willing to do it. And, and in reality, the man had a greater love for his possessions and eternal life. Jesus is calling us to remove the obstacles in our life. And in the same way, Jesus calls us to remove anything in our lives that hinders an all-out commitment to him. But listen, the problem is our pride gets in the way. A relationship that detracts from your commitment, a possession or a hobby or a leisure activity, pride, self-reliance, a schedule, focus on climbing the ladder. Until you give it up, you will not have eternal quality of life. Your life will continue to be void of peace and joy and happiness. The Bible even says that sin is pleasure for season. And what you're doing may not even be sinful. But if you put it before God, you're doing it as a sin. And it may be fun for the moment. But eventually there's going to come a time that you're going to understand and realize that this is not what I need to be doing. The pursuit of money is a snare, diversion, a false source of security. And this astounded the disciples because wealth was seen as a blessing it was seen as a sign of God's favor. And so the disciples are confused, and Jesus reiterates that, that the famous saying about threading a camel through the eye of a needle. Camel. I don't believe he literally meant a camel. Because that is literally impossible. Now, if God wanted to do so, he could do it. I believe God could just, and the camel shrink down so small that you could just thread it through an eye of a needle. But I believe here what he really was saying was the camel representing a rope. He 
is trying to make them understand that a rope, it is impossible, it's difficult to get through the eye of a needle. And the eye of a needle, I want you to understand this, get this, the eye of a needle refers to a gate in the wall that required the camel to walk on its knees to get through the gate. Are you with me? And so he said, it's like trying to thread a camel through the needle. It's like trying to get a camel to get on its knees to walk through so they can get through the gate and get into where it needs to go. It's a picture of impossibility is what he was saying. If you don't get anything else, I want you to understand that. What Jesus was saying was that that's impossible. It's impossible to get a camel through a needle. But with God, all things, somebody shout all things, are possible. I've come to ask you today, what obstacles are there in your life right now? What is it that keeps you from the kind of devotion that Jesus wants to bring real life to you? This is why we can go to church and be Christians but not live any differently. Because we're living in religion and not relationship. Because relationship will change you. Religion will keep you the same. I'm moving on. I, some of y'all are already done, I can tell. Number three, this is the last point I want you to write down. Number three, we've got to remove all obstacles. Remove all obstacles. We must rid ourselves of anything that gets in the way. Just when this seems rather hard, rather daunting, Jesus injects some really good news. Devotion to Jesus has its present rewards. Jesus says, relax. It's impossible to give something up for me without being rewarded. Jesus says, if you serve me, then I'll bless you more. Y'all ain't hearing me yet. <laughs> I have seen wealthy people give and give and give. Now, it, you say, well, they've got more to give. Yeah, they may have more to give, but you know why they have more to give? Because they continually give. We cannot expect to not give and keep our fists closed and tight and then we pray God open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon me and our fist is clenched as tight as it can be but it's when we decide to open up our hands we open up our arms and we open up our heart and say God I may not have much but this is what I have and this is what I'm going to give oh he told him to tell you Jesus says it's impossible to give something up for me without being rewarded. So following Jesus may require that we give up something. Now, everybody, something is different. Come on, somebody. We're all different. That's what makes the world go round. If we were all the same, this would be the most boring earth in the world. This church would be boring. Every church would be boring because we'd all be the same. That's what I love about this church, the diversity. We're all different. Different races, different cultures, different breeds. It, it, it creeds. It, it doesn't matter where we've come from. It doesn't matter what our last name is. We're all welcome here. We're all here to worship together because we're one body. We've come here together. So re following Jesus may require us to give up something. It may be relationships. It may be uh, lifestyles. It may be things. But remember, whatever the Lord puts in your heart to give up for him, if you give it up, he'll reward you. Y'all with me? I'm, almost, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring this to a close. Proverbs 16 and 18. You know this scripture. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. I've known some prideful people in my life. And I've known some haughty people in my life. I may have not have seen them fall in front of me, but if they continue in the trek that they're in, they're going to fall flat on their face. And Proverbs 16, 18 is a direct comparison of Proverbs 15, 33. Go, go to Proverbs 15, 33. Watch this. The fear of the Lord is instruction and wisdom, and humility comes before honor. 
Pride comes before destruction. Humility comes before honor. So before God is going to honor us or bless us, we've got to, come on, y'all, we've got to humble ourselves because it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me, but it's all about Jesus. Haughtiness and pride imply self-confidence, which produces carelessness and, and a hence a fall, literally sliding compared to the instruction of wisdom and humility coming before honor. The word here used for pride is gaon, G-A apostrophe O-W-N, and it means arrogancy, excellency, majesty, pomp, swelling. That means you're so prideful, your head has got so big it can't fit through the doorway. You done got swole. Not in a good way. And the rich man ran to Jesus and he knelt before him and he addressed him as great teacher and the man was respectful. And it seems he honestly wanted to learn. And when speaking with the, the rich young ruler, Jesus explained that he needed to sell all that he owned to give his earnings to the poor and, and follow him in order to be saved. Jesus wasn't saying that money or possessions are necessarily evil, but this man had been a strict rule follower, yet was finding his security in his wealth. In his conversation with Jesus, he found something he couldn't buy with money. The Bible says that he left sorrowful. We do know that he deeply loved his possessions and he felt the weight of the decision that Jesus put before him. And after this rich young ruler went away, Jesus turned to the disciples and reframed the scenario as a discipleship lesson. He said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Matthew Henry gives two explanations for what Jesus meant. He says, perhaps there might be some wicked gate or door to Jerusalem commonly known by the name of the needle's eye for its straightness through which a camel could not uh, be got unless he were unloaded or made to kneel. So a rich man cannot get to heaven unless he's willing to part with his worldly wealth and stoop to the duties of a humble servant and so enter at the straight gate. Y'all... Some of y'all may know where I'm going. Because when Jesus said this to the disciples, he was already, he already knew he was king of kings. Y'all hearing me? And the Bible says that God robed himself in flesh and became a servant. And he knelt and he served. And that's what Jesus came to this earth to do. So we find the king becoming a lowly servant. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me right now. And so when Jesus said it's more difficult for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he's saying that it's more difficult for the camel to kneel, to become a servant, to go through the straight and through the narrow. I need you to hear me. Others suggest that the word we translate as camel sometimes signifies a, a cable rope, which though uh, not to be got through a needle's eye, yet it is of great affinity to it. A rich man compared with the poor, is as capable to a single thread, stronger but not so pliable, and it will not go through the needle's eye unless it be untwisted. Pride is what often twists us up. Pride is often that hidden sin, one that is a little more acceptable for us as Christians to carry around in our luggage. But people who refuse to let others know they aren't perfect, who hide their sin, who decline to make a, a change in their lifestyle because they won't admit sin, or who so highly prioritize their reputation, are often carrying the bag labeled pride. Tim Elmore writes about pride and image management. He says, over the years, I have decided to ditch working on my reputation and work on my reality. In other words, my integrity is the key to solidify how others view me. Remember the term integrity simply means one or whole. 
in math, an integer is a single digit. When I have integrity, it doesn't mean I am a perfect leader. It means what I say and what I do are the same. Mm -hmm. I am transparent about who I am. It's the opposite of hypocrisy. As I work on my character, my reputation takes care of itself because I am not pretending to be anyone other than who I really am. I'm not a hiker, as you can tell by my physique. Unless I've got an oxygen tank with me. But true hikers, people who hike a lot, they focus on and spend lots of money on packing low-weight items for their, their backpacks. And the goal weight, get this, the goal weight is 20 pounds of items to last them the length of their hike. And I want you to compare that. Now, Ryland's done a lot of flying in the past couple of weeks. And every time you go to check in your bag, it can't weigh over 50 pounds. Well, most, or suitcase, not a bag, it's a big suitcase. Now, most people push that to the limit. And there are a lot of people that go over the 50 pounds, and so they're trying to reshuffle and redo some things so that it gets under that 50 pounds. So I want you to imagine and think that the difference in uh, someone who is hiking trying to make sure that their backpack weighs 20 pounds or less compared to one who is traveling for a week or so whose suitcase may weigh 50 pounds. Y'all hear me? Because hikers know that they'll be carrying the weight of everything they need. A stove, a tent, first aid, food, water, uh, extra socks, fire starter, so on. The, the list goes on. And ruthlessly fight to select only the most lightweight, multi-purpose, and essential items for their backpack. Now, when we're going for a week and we got a big old suitcase, we're just like, pack everything. We should take the same approach as the hikers when considering the invisible weight we are willing to carry in our emotional baggage. Come on, somebody. Some of us are willing to carry the pride around. Uh, uh, Y'all, I'm done. I'm done. Rylan, come. Come. Uh, these people are done. They've been done. I want to ask you today, what can we get rid of? What is not essential in your life? Let me help you. Nothing is essential in your life other than Jesus. <laughs> Woo. So if those things in your life are keeping you from Jesus, that you deem as essential, it's time to get rid of it. What will promote or protect our health on our journey? What has been proven true and helpful for those who have hiked this journey before us? Hear me. If, if you're still taking notes, write this down because you, you, you want to go back and look this and do a little research. I don't have time right now to go in depth. But another description for pride is stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Meaning stubborn uncompromising or unwilling to do what someone else wants. And it fits the perfect description of a toddler. Y'all were kids, you know what I'm talking about. You may not have toddlers now, but you did at one time. And it fits the perfect description of a young toddler who doesn't want to give up the toy that doesn't belong to them or to obey whoever is speaking to them. Anyone who has spent time with children has seen the stiffening of the spine and the neck. You know what I'm talking about then? My! Sometimes crossing their arms. The turning of their body. And they literally turn away from what should have their attention. <laughs> 
Sadly, too many of us haven't matured beyond this stage. Some of us are still toddlers in our spirit world. And when we don't get our way, or things don't happen the way we think they should happen, or God doesn't answer our prayer the way we think He should answer our prayer, or He doesn't do exactly what we want Him to do, turn our backs, cross our arms and begin to pout and have a pity party for one I've come to tell you today that relationship supersedes religion I've come to tell you to set down the pride in your baggage be, listen it's time for the church to be its real self to God You know why? Because God already sees you where you are. He already knows where you're at. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knew you from the time you were born into a toddler, to a teenager, to an adult, wherever you're at, whatever stage of life you're in right now. He knew you. And not only did he know you, and does he know you now, he's going to know you in the future. He knows what your plans and your purpose are in the days and the years to come down the road. We, the church, have got to learn to be our real self to God. You say, why, Pastor? Because he already knows you. He's just waiting on you to admit where you're at. Because God is a gentleman. He will never force himself on you. He will never make you do anything against your will. You notice I said your will. And so he's waiting for us to surrender and to give ourselves to him and say, All right, God, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of doing my own thing. I'm tired of allowing pride to get into my way. God, here am I. I surrender to you, and I want your will in my life, God. So just let me be a vessel for you to flow through. We've got to be our real self to God and to others. We've got to be free from pride through a hard conversation or an honest prayer. It it trips me out how many people aren't honest in their prayer. We think God can't see. We're trying to hide and cover up things. And God's, God's got x-ray vision, y'all. He can see everything. So you might as well admit it all to him anyways. That's what he's waiting on. That's what he's waiting on. Be free from the pride. Hear me. Only God can thread a camel through a needle eye. <laughs> I don't care what situation you're in. I don't care how much pride you may have in your life. I don't care how much, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through. I've come to tell you with man it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Only God can thread a camel through a needle's eye. Only God can break us out of our illusion of security and self-sufficiency to help us see our need, how great our need is for Him. When that call comes to us, It has to take priority over everything else in our lives. And the more we have, the bigger our obstacles. But responding to that call is worth any sacrifice that we might make. Listen, let's put our pride aside and focus on following Jesus with all that's within us. Stand with me. I'm done. I want to close with this thought. This series has been entitled Freedom Fighters, and God has called us to be freedom fighters. Because there is a lost and dying world outside of these four walls that need Jesus. And they may not know how to find Jesus. They may not know where to find Jesus. And God is calling us all to be freedom fighters to help them to find Him. And so today I wanted to preach about pride because sometimes, many times, if we're not careful, we'll become so prideful and self-sufficient that when someone new walks in the door, we'll look down our self-righteous nose at them. Because we've been living for Jesus for 
10, 15, 20 years, and they, they don't know anything about Jesus. So, and I'm telling you right now, that is nothing but a prideful spirit. God isn't pleased with ugly, and that's ugly. Y'all hear me? If it were not for the grace of God, where would any of us be? I want you to put yourself in every new guest, every new visitor's position. That when they walk into this door, that was you one of those times. Uh, when you didn't know Jesus, you didn't know him for yourself. You didn't have a relationship with him. And you were depending on your religion and everything around you that you knew. And in the moment, you just needed somebody to show you Jesus. I've come to tell Life Restoration Center that it's not about you, but it's all about Him. Everything we do here points to Jesus. Everything we do here is about Him. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're experiencing, but I've come to tell you that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I feel the spirit of God flowing in this house right now. I wonder just for the just the next few moments. I, I, I'm not going to tarry long, but the next few moments as they get ready to to sing, get ready to play. I wonder if we could just close our eyes and lift our hands right where we're at. And I, I just want you to take an, a minute. Just take one minute. Take one minute and begin to talk to God. And then after this minute, I'm going to open up these altars. And I, I want everyone that feels the tug. I want everyone that feels uh, God calling you. I want you to begin to make your way down to this altar. And we're going to pray with you. And we're going to help you. God wants to do something in your life. Come on, just the next minute. Uh, come on, open up your mouth. Don't be afraid to say anything. Don't be afraid to talk to God. Come on, don't worry about who's next to you. That, that's a pride thing. When you're afraid to open up your mouth and talk to God, that's a pride thing. Come on, God wants to hear your voice. God wants to hear you talk to him. Come on, he, that's what he's here for. Come on, it doesn't matter what you're saying. It, come on, just begin to speak to him. Begin to talk to him right now. Come on, in the power of the name of Jesus. Come on, reveal to us, oh God. Show us if there's anything in us that's not of you, God. Show us if there's any pride. Come on, it's a part of my prayer every single day. God, remove any pride or selfishness in my life. Come on, that should be your prayer right now, God. If there's any pride, if there's any selfishness in my heart, in my, in my life, God, I pray that you would show me. God, I pray that you would reveal it to me. I pray, oh God, that you would begin to remove it from my life. God, because I want more of you and less of me. Come on, that should be your prayer right now. More of you, God, and less of me. Come on, in the power of the name of Jesus, come on. More of you, God, and less of me. Fill me to an overflowing. Fill me until my cup overflows, oh God. Fill me until my cup overflows. Come on, if you've never been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, God wants to fill you today. All right, listen, listen. This is what I want us to do. If you felt the tug of God, if you feel God impressing you, if you feel God uh, drawing you right now, I want you to begin to walk out from your seat. But listen, before you make your way, I want you to look to your neighbor and ask them and say, do you need someone to walk to the altar with you? And if they do, if they say yes, just bring them down. Y'all come together. Come together and say, I'm here with you. I'm here to pray with you. I'm here to help you. I want to do everything that I can do to help you. Come on. It doesn't matter if you've known them all your life. It doesn't matter if you just met them. Come on, just invite somebody to come down to the altar with you. Come on, invite someone to come down to the altar with you. Come on, it doesn't matter if you know them. Come on, it doesn't matter. Just come on, just invite somebody to come down to the altar with you. My God, I feel a releasing in this house right now. Come on, I feel a loosing in this house right now. Come on, I, I feel some chains about to be loosed. I feel some chains about to be set free. Come on, I feel a releasing. I feel a releasing in this house right now. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on. Now this is what I want you to do. I want you to begin to surrender to you. Come on. Come on. If you come down with somebody in the altar, begin to pray with them. Begin to pray over them. Come on. 
Come on, if you begin to, if you came with somebody to the altar, begin to pray with them. Begin to help them pray. Come on. Come on, put your arms around them. Put your arms around the shoulder. Come on, begin to show them. Come on. Come on, don't let your pride get in the way. Come on, don't let your pride get in the way. Let God move in your life. Let God speak into your life. Come on, it's only by Him. It's only through Him. He's the only one. He's the only one. It's all about Him. It's not about us. It's not about who we are. It's not about what we can do. But it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. Begin to touch the throne of God. Come on, begin to touch the throne of God. Come on, somebody. If you've got the power of the Holy Ghost, come on, begin to pray in the Spirit. Come on, begin to pray in the Spirit. Come on, invite the presence of God in this house. Come on, come on, all over this house. Come on, don't let pride get in your way. Don't let pride get in your way. Come on, it's not about you. It's about what Jesus can do in you and through you. Come on, it's all about him. It's all about him. I'm not here for blessing. I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, you don't know. Come on, church, open up your mouth. Come on, begin to talk to him. Come on, don't try to hold it in. Come on, just let it begin to flow. Let it begin to flow. Let it begin to flow. Let Let God have his way in your life. Let God have his way in your life. Come on. Come on. Come on, don't. This isn't the time to be reserved. This isn't the time to be hesitant. This isn't the time. Come on, don't allow the enemy of your soul to win. Don't allow the enemy of your soul to win.
Nothing else. Nothing else. Come on, God is moving. Nothing God is moving. Come on. Come on, let God move. Let God I move. Come on, let him do what he wants to do in this house. Nothing yes, God. Come on. Nothing I'm not letting my pride get in the way. I'm not Nothing allowing my pride to get in the way. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, 
church. I need some prayer warriors. I need some people that know how to get into touch with the throne of God. I need some people who know how to intercede. I need some people who know the power of God. I need you to, I need you to know. Come on, in unison, one body. We're in this together. We're in this together. No pride. It's not about you. It's not about me, but it's about Jesus. Come on, we're in this together. We're in this together. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Break every chain in the name of Jesus. Loose every fetter in the name of Jesus. Loose every shackle in the name of Jesus. Let there be a releasing in the name of Jesus. Let there be a loosing in the name of Jesus. Come on, people of faith. Come on, people of faith. Tap in. Tap in. Tap into the Spirit of God. Tap into the Spirit of God. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we declare freedom in this house. We declare freedom in this house. We declare liberty in this house. We declare freedom. We declare liberty. We declare a loosing in this house. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Spirit of God, Spirit of God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we magnify you. We exalt you. And the power of the name of Jesus. And the power of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I speak, I speak. I speak deliverance in this house. I speak deliverance in this house. Freedom. And the only saving name. And the only saving name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yolo more de baca sala la la boho torre de bacaye. Ya la boho so torre de bacaye. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're not going to tarry on much longer. If you signed up to be baptized, if you'll go ahead and come up and line up over here, we're going to go ahead and get you started. If you're praying, keep praying. If you're praying, keep praying. But if you signed up to be baptized, or if you didn't sign up and you want to be baptized, if you'll show up over here to the side. We have robes. We have towels. You don't have to get anything you have wet. Everything we have, we'll, we'll take care of. We have robes. We have towels. Everything that you need. Just come back here and get changed. It'll take you five minutes to be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus Christ, to be baptized the right way, the right way in the name of Jesus. If you signed up, you'll come over here and meet us on this side. Or if you want to be baptized, 
We'd love to baptize you. We'd love to have the opportunity to baptize you today in the, in the only saving name of Jesus. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I would encourage you and urge you to, to be baptized in the name of Jesus today. It's the only saving name. It is the name of Jesus. It is in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in this house today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the hope that you've given us, that you've restored to us. We thank you, God, for the presence that is in this house today. Lord, you've been good to us. You've been more than enough. You've been great, O oh God, and we thank you. And we bless your wonderful name. Can we, just, can we just lift our hands and give God praise and give him honor as they get ready to sing another song? Can we just, come on, with everything in you. I know we've been here for a while. I know we've been worshiping. I know we've heard the word. Come on, I know God has moved, but I wonder if just the, if you could just give God praise and give God honor for what he's done in this house. Come on, God, you're worthy. You're worthy of everything, Jesus. My life is incomplete without you. My life is meaningless without you. My life, oh God, is yours. I put it in your hands. God, we worship you. As they're getting ready to be baptized, can we just, let's sing another song and just worship God for, for the next few moments until they're ready to be baptized here in another moment. Let's just sing and worship and give honor to God. So freely given, such a bride, but our redemption, heaven's gate, swing wide. Oh, there's an army, there's an
getting ready to do it. Yeah. He's getting ready to break some chains. He's getting ready to loose some things that have had people bound. We were standing back here and I was just talking with him briefly and I, I said, who wants to go first? And Danielle was like, me, 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 me. I was like, well, let's do it. Let's do it. She's ready. God is, God is doing something amazing in her life. Amen. God is turning some things around. That what the enemy meant for evil, God is intending for good. Amen. Amen. Oh, my Lord, I feel it. I feel it. We were, I was praying with her in the altar. I told her, I said, you've already repented. I heard you repent. And now you're, t- you're taking on the second command to be buried with him in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. And now the only thing left is God's promise to fill you with the Spirit. So that's what we're believing for today. We're believing for today that God's going to do something miraculous in Daniela's life and that God is just going to continue to touch her and be with her and uh, just continue to, to keep his hand upon her. Go ahead and grab your nose for me. Lord, I thank you for Daniela right now. I thank you, oh God, for the drawing that you have placed on her heart and in her spirit. God, I know and understand that there are great things in store for her life, God. You are calling her to another level and another dimension. God, and I'm believing for greater things to begin to happen and take place in her life, including, God, you filling her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. God, I pray right now, God, that as we bury her in baptism in the name of Jesus, God, that as she comes up out of the water, God, that you will baptize her with the power of the Holy Ghost. God, continue to order her steps and guide her. God, and show her your ways. God, and move in her life and continue to give her the direction that she needs. God, we're believing for great and mighty things in her life right now. Daniela, because you've repented of your sins in obedience to the word of God, I now baptize you in the name that's above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah! Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Come on. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, O oh God, for your forgiveness. We thank you, O oh Lord, for washing away our sins. We thank you, O oh God, for cleansing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, we give you glory. We give you glory. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Daniela had never been baptized, um, and so she wanted to be baptized and dedicate her life to the Lord. These next three have been baptized, but they want to be rebaptized as a sign of a new commitment to God. And that's that's perfectly fine. I, I told them that's that's awesome. They want to rededicate their life to God and a, and a new commitment, a new day. And uh, God is doing some things in their life, um, and He's continuing to move in their life, and we're thankful for that. And uh, God is going to do great and mighty things in their life as they continue to surrender and continue to walk in His will. He's going to show them uh, exactly what He wants them to do and who He's called them to be. And there's going to be a, an awesome. There's going to. Uh, I know they've already begun to experience a transformation, and uh, it's only going to get better from here. And uh, so we're we're grateful and we're believing for all that God is going to do right now. Right now, Jesus, I pray. God, I speak blessing upon Megan's life. God, you have brought her this far. You've brought her a mighty long way. Although, God, she is not who she used to be, and thank God, God, we know that she's not who she's going to be, God, because you're not finished with her yet. There are still great and mighty things in store for her. God, and so I speak right now upon the authority of the Word of God that you would order her steps, oh God, and guide her and continue to show you, show her your ways, oh God. For your ways are higher than her ways and your thoughts are higher than her thoughts. And so right now, God, we're believing for great things in her life as you continue to transform her and bless her, God, and do what only you can do in her life. And so right now, Megan, because you've repented of your sins, because God has already filled you with the power of the Holy Ghost, and as a sign of rededication and renewal in Him, I now baptize you in the name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Yes, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Careful going down the steps. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You ready? You take it. Yeah. Whoa, careful. That's, that's why I hold your hand. That's why I hold your hand. Go ahead and come around and sit. Yep, there you go. Just 
stick your toes in the groove here on the bottom. Yep, there you go. You got it. Amen, amen. We're thankful for B and Megan and uh, for being a part of this church and Life Restoration Center. And uh, they, B, B, B came to this church as a, as a young child. I think you said five or six. Is that right? Is it that young? Yeah, five or six. And uh, came to this church for a little while and then um, has kind of moved around and been around. And then ultimately, full circle, came back to this church as an adult, married with his wife and, and his children. And uh, so I, I believe, I believe no doubt that the Lord has, has brought um, B and Megan back to this church and ordered their steps back to this church for a purpose and for a reason that God is going to use them and, uh, and work through them and do what only he can do uh, through the power of his might. And so B wanted to be rebaptized today again in the name of Jesus. And so we're going to do so. And uh, God is going to continue to cover him and be with him. Lord, I thank you right now for B. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the touch of God that is on his life. God, I thank you for the calling that you have placed in his life and in his family. God, you see great and mighty things that you have in store. And so, God, I pray right now, God, that in this day, a new day of rededicating and a, and a day of God recommitting their life, I pray right now, God, great and mighty things, beautiful things to come forth from this life. God, that as you begin to move and begin to operate in them, God, that they would just be vessels, God, for your spirit to flow through and operate through. God, we're believing, God, that you're going to continue to cover them and order their steps, oh God, and do what only you can do. In the power of your name, and the power of your might, we declare right now, in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and grab your nose for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right now, Lebrowski, because you've repented of your sins and you wanted to rededicate your life to God I, in obedience to the word of God, I now baptize you in the name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Patrick's. Patrick is a uh, Patrick's a part of our ministry staff here, and uh, he and his wife Talisha have been uh, a part of our ministry staff this year, and uh, they're doing a tremendous job with life groups and doing a tremendous job. And we, we put them over that, and they're doing a fantastic job, and we couldn't be prouder of them. And uh, Patrick was baptized as a teenager, um, but he said he felt pressure to do so. <laughs> didn't really understand and didn't really, he just he just did it. And uh, so now when we, when we were going to do this, he said, I want to be rebaptized. He said, this is on my own because I know and understand now the meaning of it and the reasoning behind it. 
And so, uh, so he wanted to be rebaptized today in the in the only saving name of Jesus, and that's that's perfectly all right because God is doing something incredible in Patrick's life. And uh, if 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 you'd have known Patrick ten years ago, you 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 would see a completely different person today. Um, that's how much God has changed and moved in his life, and uh, I'm just excited. I'm excited to see what God's going to do and continue to use him and pour into him and uh, to, to be a great vessel for the kingdom of God and to help grow the kingdom of God. And so I, I just can't wait. I can't wait to sit back and, and watch and see what all God does uh, in Patrick's life. God, I thank you right now. I thank you for Patrick today. I thank you for his hunger, oh God, and, and uh, his desire, oh God, to know you more. He God, his desire right now is to rededicate himself to you. God, today would be a new day and a new start, a fresh start. God, for what you want to do in his life and where you want to take him. God, and how you want to use him for your glory. God, I'm believing for great and mighty things. God, to be revealed in his life. God, as he continues to follow you, as he continues to search for you. God, your word declares he will find you. And so right now, God, I pray that your spirit would rest down upon him. God, you'd begin, oh God, to move in his life and show yourself strong. Remove any obstacle. Remove any hindrance or distractions. God, that would rise up against him. God, as he commits himself to you. God, and rededicates his life to you. We're believing for great and mighty things in his life. God, and we thank you for all that you're doing right now in the power of the name of Jesus. Huh. Grab your wrist. There you go. Patrick, because you've repented of your sins in obedience to the word of God and wanting to rededicate your life to him today, I now baptize you in the name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah!
I love what God is doing. This is... This is uh, this is Terrell, this is B's brother, and uh, the, him and him and Daniela have been coming to the church here for a little while now too, and uh, he also wanted to be rebaptized and a rededication to his life to the Lord, and uh, God's been doing some great things in his life. I I'm, I don't know if he'd been filled with the power of the Holy Ghost before, but I, I know uh, about a month or so ago he was down here on the altar praying the Lord. If he hadn't been filled, God filled him. If he had, God renewed him. Uh, either way. Either way, either way, the Lord, the Lord did a work in his life, and uh, we're thankful for that. And uh, God is continuing to do work right now, and uh, we're so happy and thrilled to be a small part of what God is doing in their life and uh, how He's working and moving in their life. So right now, God, I thank you for Terrell. I thank you, O oh God, for the drawing and the wooing of Your Spirit, O oh Lord, in his life and in his heart. God, you are calling him to another place and to another level. God, and I'm believing that you have great things in store for him. And so right now, as I pray over him, God, I'm praying right now that you would begin and continue to move in his life, showing yourself strong, God, and reminding him of who you are in his life, that he is nothing without you, but God, through you, all things are possible. And so right now, God, I pray a covering over his mind and over his heart. God, I pray, God, a covering over his eyes and over his ears, the gates to his soul. I pray, oh God, that you would just bless him and continue to use him and be with him. God, and use him in the kingdom of God to help flourish and grow, God, this kingdom. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in his life. And we give you glory and honor and praise in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Go ahead and grab your nose for me and grab your wrist with me. There you go. Right now, Terrell, uh, because you've repented of your sins, because the Lord has already filled you with His Spirit, according to the Word of God and obedience to the Word of God, I now baptize you in the name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Come on, let it go. Come on, let it out. Come on, let God move. Let God move. Thank you for washing me clean. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for a new life. Thank you for a fresh start. Thank you, oh God, for what you're doing in my life. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Bless God. We rejoice. I know we went a little long today, but that's all right. That's all right. Listen, I would encourage you, stick around, shake hands, hug necks with those that were baptized today. Congratulate them. Welcome them. They're already a part of the family, but but uh, just tell them how much you love them and appreciate them and proud of them for making a new step and a new uh, a new day in their life as they re- rededicated and, and then Daniela was baptized for the first time. So that's exciting. That's exciting. So shake hands with one another, hug necks, let them know you love them, appreciate them. And uh, if you're in first steps, we've got first steps immediately following right now in the fellowship hall. Lunch is provided, child care is provided. And if not, everybody else, we'll see you back here Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for prayer. You don't want to miss what God is doing here in this house. And we're believing and expecting great and mighty things. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed and and, uh, a week in God. And uh, we hope you have a great week. And we'll see you back here Wednesday night.